Thank you. Thank you. I am extremely excited to be here. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to take maybe 75, maybe 90 seconds to tell you a bit about my background, where I come from, why I'm even interested in the topic of innovation and diversity. So I'll do that now. The, the, the answer to the question where I come from is my parents. Uh, <laughs> so you need to know something about my parents. My, uh, my mother is black and Cherokee, my dad is Swedish, and they met in Germany. But I was born and raised in Sweden, which is located here. So now, something about Sweden during the time I grew up in this country. Okay, Sweden consisted essentially of two groups of people. Uh, one group was uh, blonde, blue-eyed, and, uh, and quite reserved. <laughs> and the other group was me, basically. Uh, <laughs> this is a joke, obviously. It's me and my sister. Uh, yes, where I went to college, I studied environmental science for the following reasons. And when I did that, I saw there were a lot of different scientific researchers at this campus, but I didn't really feel that they were connecting the purpose of the research with each other. I wanted them to do that, so I created a magazine for that. That inspired me to start a healthcare company based on my aunt's research at Johns Hopkins. After that, I went to uh, business school, and then I started a software company, which did quite well until it didn't. And, um, <laughs> And then I got an idea for a book. It was based on intersections. I had seen that in my life, whenever I combined ideas from different cultures I've been exposed to, or from the different industries I've been exposed to, I had a better chance of developing something groundbreaking. And I wondered, is that the generalized truth for innovation? So I decided to research that, which took me far longer than I ever imagined. I was literally down to my last $2.45. But things started turning around. The book came out. It was... Uh, you can ask me later why it's called Medici, uh, but it was very well received. Uh, at this point, it's translated into 17 languages. I get to do speaking engagements all over the world. In the middle of all this, in fact, I, uh, I got married, and here's my 11-month-old daughter, and now I'm here with you. This is based on my story up in this particular point in time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, some say that the world is connected, okay? But some, sometimes the world sure can seem divided. Right? It's divided along generational lines, for instance. Uh, there's people from one generation that believes that their heroes and inspiration comes from people like Martin Luther King, and then they look at their kids, and they believe that their inspiration comes from the DJs at the, the dance clubs of hip-hop or techno. It's divided along values. Some people believe that banking is critical as a backbone for our society, and that necessitates a big difference between the world's rich and those less fortunate. Uh, banker's bonus, for instance, this year would probably be the biggest ever. And then there's others that believe that there should be far more equity, and they try to, try to eradicate the world's poverty through, say, charity, although charity donations have been down roughly 50% this year. It's divided along education. There's some people believe that there's a catastrophe coming in education. It's not broad enough. It is too standardized, and we're taking away things like art, we're taking away things like music for our kids. And then there's others that believe that we need to be far more specialized, far more focused, particularly when it comes to technology and science. In this global economy, if we don't have standards, we will fall behind. It is divided across cultures. In some places, women can wear pretty much whatever they want. In others, tradition and rules dictate how they should wear what to cover up what body part. It is divided along environments. Uh, we build more buildings than ever before. Yes, there's a short-term blip, but all the long-term trends speak for a vast increase in buildings. And building a building takes a lot of energy. Running a building takes a lot of energy. Imagine what will happen when China, India, and Africa all have air conditioning in every single one of their buildings. And then there's others <clears> that will look at a place like this on African savanna, a termite mound there, and say, you know, this is a place that has to be protected. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Or are we simply becoming cemented in our views? Are we becoming cemented in our views? My answer is yes. Um, there's light in the tunnel. We can shift. We can connect. It requires us to reverse our assumptions. Assumptions are reversed. Take, for instance, the notion of cement, right? You can look at that and you can make the assumption that you can't see through it. It's not see-through. But what happens if you decide to connect cement with optical fibers? These are glass rods, essentially, that will conduct light. And if you lay them horizontally across the cement, you should be able to build a wall. But you would make that wall see-through. Okay? This is a hand. You can see it on the other side of the wall. A company in Hungary, Litracon, has done exactly that. They have uh, taken walls, and then they pull these optical fibers, sometimes up to the ground. 
That means they can build basements with daylight. This is the way that you innovate. You innovate by making unusual connections, connecting things that are disparate. So what are the rules of innovation? With the remaining 12 minutes, I'm going to, uh, 13 minutes, I'm going to walk through the six rules of innovation. Here's the first one. All new ideas are combinations of existing ideas. Okay, so take this guy, his name is Mick Pierce. He's an architect, he receives this challenge one day. He's to build the largest building in Harada, the capital of Zimbabwe, but this building is to contain no air conditioning, right? This is intriguing because on occasion, it gets hot in Zimbabwe. <laughs> but he manages to accomplish this by combining his field of expertise with the field of termite ecology. So here's how it works. Termites build these mounds on the African savanna, and they need to keep an exact 80 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit inside of these mounds in order to grow fungi, which helps them digest wood. But of course, the temperature on the African savanna can fluctuate between 40 at night and over, over 100 degrees during the day. So how do the termites do it? Well, here's what they do. They build these vents around the base of the mound, and then they redirect air breezes into these vents into a cool pool of mud at the bottom of the mound, and then they circulate this air up, and by, um, uh, there we go. By opening and closing vents constantly, they can regulate the temperature exactly. So Mick Pierce looked at this and he said, well, hold on. I can use the same principle for my building, which is what he did. Eastgate is the largest building in Harare. It uses no air conditioning, which saved them $4 million right away. And it uses about 90% less energy than any other building around it, with a set of temperature of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Innovative? It's up there. <laughs> Why do we call it innovative? What is, what is so special about this? Why do we call this particular uh, uh, idea innovative? It comes down to the second fact of innovation, which is that not all idea combinations are created equal, right? Uh, the, the closer connected a concept is, the le um, less likely it is to actually be groundbreaking, where if it's far apart, if it seems like an unlikely connection, you increase the chance of it being very innovative. Take a bikini, for instance. If you combine that with something like, say, a beach, right, you're not gonna be flabbergasted by innovative potential this offers. But if you combine it with a burka, well, now maybe there's something interesting here. And a woman may, named Ahida Sinetti, Lebanese woman, she moved, a traditional Muslim woman, she moved to Australia, and there she realized that Australia is a very strong beach culture, and essentially the dress code for the beach in Australia is something like this. But for a traditional Muslim woman, you have to go swimming in something like that, which, frankly, is not very comfortable. So most of them end up sitting on the beach while their husbands and kids go swimming. And so she looked at that and said, well, hold on. Why can't I combine my traditional Muslim culture with the Australian beach culture? Why can't I combine a burqa with a bikini? Why can't I create the burkini? which essentially is the burqa of a key material. Now take a look at this and imagine just for a moment what you think the market would be for something like this. Her company is taking off like crazy all over the world. And you know what's really fascinating about this, I think? It is that how come nobody thought about this before? I mean, this is uncomfortable and you know it, <laughs> right? But the thing is, almost all innovative ideas seem obvious after the fact. It is before the fact. I mean, that's when we really need it. All right, so um, <laughs> now, more ideas lead to better ideas. This is a research has clearly shown that the, the most innovative individuals and teams and organizations are those that have generated and try to execute the most ideas. This is true when you talk about artists or scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, any category, anywhere. And the reason for that is because of a fundamental human flaw when it comes to innovation. And it is this. We, as human beings, are not particularly good at predicting what ideas are going to work or not work, right? Because, I mean, because if we were, we would never ever try ideas that don't work. Yeah. And we try ideas that don't work all the time. You could have thought about something, you didn't share it with anybody. Fail. You share it with somebody, the person doesn't like it. Fail. The person loves it, now the committee hates it. The committee likes it, but the, the idea doesn't work. The idea works, but the customer doesn't like it. The customer loves it, but a competitor beat you to it. There is no competitor, but now there's no supply. Right? There is no supply. And that's pretty good. Like if, you, <laughs> if you have all those things, you have a pretty good idea. But the fact is, failure can happen 
at any point in the process. And throughout all my interviews all over the world, this was the most consistent trait I found. And that is why you have to keep on trying. You want to come up with something that really changes the game, changes the world, maybe gives you uh, brand equity or market share, maybe helps you influence thousands, maybe helps you influence millions. You have to keep on trying in order to find that idea that's going to work. You know that Picasso, in his lifetime, produced 20,000 works of art. Most of them are collecting dust in basements around the world. Why? Because they suck. <laughs> That's why. So, so, find ways to generate more ideas, okay? Uh, this is Richard Sheridan. Uh, he founded a, a software company in, uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, called Menlo Innovations. And that has been part, one of, the, one of the aspects of him becoming, trying to become successful. What he really done is he takes people that understand technology well, software developers, and he really tries to introduce as many new, broad perspectives as possible. Here you have an uh, image of his office. And if we zoom in on that a little bit and take a look at what actually is going on, you see something interesting. So here you see that there's two people working in front of every computer screen. Now that's kind of weird, right? Because in a software company, or any company almost, you would imagine that there would be one person per screen, one person per computer. But here it's two. That's just, but it doesn't stop there. This team will change every Monday. Every Monday, one of these people would go on to another team. And everybody in the entire company does this. Now, on the face of it, this sounds like it, it just couldn't possibly work. But if you think about it, imagine what would happen. First, you would get work done, right? Because when you team up on Monday, you know that on Friday, the two are going to leave. So you, you better get something done. You, you can uh, uh, structure it out, and you'll get it done. Two always new, fresh perspectives. More ideas, more ideas. You can decide which ones to test. You're not going to test all of them, but more, more new insights. It says that, in fact, the, the most successful people that join these teams can be a new employee. They just join day one. Just start right now, an intern. Can this work? Can this be successful? Uh, so he's been on the list of Forbes fastest growing companies for years. This is them on the cover. It's not, it's not a, some type of dream. It is actually the way the world works. Of course, the more ideas you generate, the higher the likelihood that you're going to make some mistakes. You have to plan for those mistakes. You have to plan for the mistakes and the failures. Mohamed Yunus uh, was desperate to try to figure out a way to solve poverty. He started out in Bangladesh. But to solve poverty around the world, that was his interest. And he tried one thing, he tried another, and finally he came up upon the idea that he wanted to combine his background in banking with the notion of charity, which he didn't feel was working as well as it could around the world. And he finally came up with this microcredit idea, microloan idea. And what he, what he did was, uh, first he tried to convince banks to use this idea. Well, that didn't work. Okay, all right, all right, all right. okay. So then he said, you know what, I'm going to guarantee the loans personally. Well, obviously you can't get any volume doing that. Failed. All right, then he went back to the banks and said, wait, hold on, wait a minute, what if we do this as an experimental program? Yeah, okay, no, they didn't dare, failed. All right, okay, so now he went to international foundations to help them guarantee the money. All right, some success there. And finally, he made it to a company mostly owned by its customers, huge success. That model spread around the world is the impetus, the reason for why he became the Nobel Peace Laureate a couple of years ago. You have to plan for the mistakes because you will inevitably make them. And if you plan for them, you can actually execute your way past them. Uh, of course, there's difficulties. You have to acknowledge that. You know, if you, uh, if, <clears throat> if you're going through hell, keep going, basically. <laughs> you don't get stuck there. <laughs> but what is it that keeps you going, though? What is it that keeps you going, right? And I, my argument is that it's passion. Passion keeps you going because passion is the reason why you will stick through an idea, have the wherewithal to stick through, through your inevitable mistakes, all right? Stick to your passions. It's your best chance for success. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. So this man followed his dream, his passion to change essentially the world by connecting it. But 
to kids in Russia uh, or Eastern Europe saw a connection between his message and what was happening in Eastern Europe during the, during the 90s. And it made it perhaps through the only way they perhaps knew how, which was through techno music. And this tune spread through clubs uh, and online from, from Eastern Europe to Europe to the United States, all over the world. They didn't change the whole world, but it did change some small part of it through the most unlikeliest of connections. And we can all do that. We can all follow our passions in, uh, in um, our work, in my work at the Medici Group. What we're trying to do is create invasion experiences all across the world in cities, bringing together people from government, from corporations from nonprofits, from students, universities, and have them brainstorm to figure out ways that they themselves, themselves, can change the world. Final piece, step into the intersection, unleash an explosion of ideas. Remember how I said that the more ideas you get, the higher the likelihood of you being innovative? Well, the amazing thing about intersections of different disciplines and countries and cultures is that we create an exponential increase of idea combinations at these intersections. So let me show how this works. You can take something, somebody like a term ecologist, and if this term ecologist only talks to other ecologists about new things, well, they will come up with some great new ideas. And then you might have architects, and they talk about some new ideas within architects. So they will come up with some new ideas. But if you break down the barriers between these different fields, you will see an exponential increase of idea combinations far, far higher than any of these two people would by themselves. If you take all the concepts that we have in this presentation, and you can imagine the connections that could be made from them, you will see them grow and grow and grow and grow. And you know what? This right here is what we have in this room. And in fact, Outside of this room, people you connect with that are different from yourself will enable you to come up with more ideas. Because more ideas lead to better ideas, we and you would have a better chance of innovating. Because the truth is, indeed, that there could be a connection between cement and bikini. I just don't know what it is, but somebody might figure it out. The world is connected, okay? Bikinis connect with burkettes, termites connect with architecture, and even Martin Luther King connects with techno music. So the world is connected. But there's someone making those connections. I think it should be you. Thank you very much. Yeah.